Good morning, Lighthouse Church and Christians abroad. I hope you're doing well in the Lord today, this morning, wherever you are. I just want to share a scripture with you. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness. Now that word paths, David was a man of war. And when he penned this psalm, he used the word paths, but when, you tra when the, the word paths is translated, not just like a, a simple little path on the side of the road, but the, tr the entrenchments, the, the, the trenches of war on, on the front lines of a battlefield. So when David wrote this, I believe as a man of war, he was picturing that God leads him in these paths when he's on the front lines of battle. In this first song, Another in the Fire, there's a grace when the heart is under fire. If your heart is under fire this morning from the enemy, God is with you and there's a grace for you in these times when the heart is under fire. Not just in the fire, but when you feel persecuted or you feel condemnation or you feel guilty, God leads you in the paths of righteousness. Whose righteousness? His righteousness. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and whose righteousness, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. So Father, I pray of God for the grace today to receive your righteousness, to press into your goodness, your work on the, on the cross, your finished work, God, and that we are righteous in Christ. God, I pray that your spirit would minister to those who need you the most right now, who are desperate for your presence, who are desperate for your mercy and your grace. In your name, Jesus, amen. There's a grace when the heart is on the fire. Another way when the walls are closed. Space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the walls holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminders? How I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire Dead left to live beneath the walls. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. And I know I will. Should I ever need reminding of how I said? 
no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come on, may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be
favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening
God is for us. He is for us. Aren't you thankful today that God is not against us, but he is for us? In this pandemic, people have questioned, <laughs> is God a good God? Last week, we tried to answer that question, that God is a good God. And we don't deserve his goodness. But he is here this morning and he is good. And his presence is so real. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to thank him for his goodness. If you'd like to give to this ministry, if this has been a blessing to you, on the screen in just a second, we're going to put up four different ways that you can give. So if you want to give this morning, just click on one of those right there, wherever you're watching. The link is right there. It'll take you to giving page where you can give or you can do it after the show. You can do it anytime. We'd just like to thank you so much for your giving and how that you have been faithful to the Lord because he has certainly been faithful to you, hasn't he? And he's certainly been faithful to me. So here's that screen up there. And if you would turn in your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Wasn't that just awesome. Chapter 12 of Hebrews. I'm going to be reading from there today, beginning in verse 18. We are continuing in part two of a message entitled, Unshakable. <laughs> Unshakable. And our text in Hebrews chapter 12, if you want to turn there, and I'm going to today read, beginning in verse 18. Last week, we talked about the text, but we didn't spend much time in it. Today, I'm going to spend a lot of time in the text because we really want to hear what God is saying to us. Verse 18, if you have your Bible apps open, I'm reading from the New International Version, if you want to click on that particular version. And I'll give you just one more second to get there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. Quote, even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Unquote. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Now, the writer here is referring specifically to Exodus chapter 19 and 20, quoting from verses from there, where God gave the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel. If you remember the story, God had all the people assemble at the base of Mount Sinai in the wilderness and Moses and Aaron went before them there, and God came down on the mountain. He came down, and there was smoke, and there was fire, and it was consuming, and the, as his voice shake, it was, God spoke to him, it says, through the thunder, and the ground literally was shaking and trembling, and the people were terrified. They said, tell God not to speak to us anymore. You <laughs> speak to him, Moses, and tell us what he says. It was that terrifying. But then in verse 22, he says, But you have come, speaking of us here, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better words than the blood of Abel. See to it then that you do not refuse who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now, he promises, once more I will shake 
not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, because of this, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Can you say amen with me to the reading of the word of God? Now last week we started this sermon series and we talked about things that are shakable. In other words, things that are not going to last. And we discovered from Scripture that everything that God created was good. He's a good God. But what happened to the earth and where we are? Why is there this pandemic and diseases and sicknesses and, and, and tsunamis and earthquakes and all these terrible things that go on? Why is there suffering and pain in the universe? And the, we discovered that the answer is us, that we brought sin, man, disobeyed God. Satan and man in the Garden of Eden brought about the fall. And from that time, we have suffered immensely. And this suffering has continued to where we are today. But we didn't leave us there in the suffering. We discovered what? We discovered that Jesus came to fix what was broken. We may live in a broken world, but Jesus can fix it. If he came to fix it, and Jesus can fix anything. And we, we left off last week talking about how we need to not settle for our broken condition, but we need to offer to Jesus our brokenness. And that God, who is a good God, when we give him our brokenness, he gives us blessedness. When we give him our mess, he turns it into a new mission. When we give God our junk, he takes our junk and makes jewels out of it. And <clears throat> so last week we talked about things that are shakable. This morning, I want to talk about things that are unshakable. In our text, the writer of Hebrews talks about us being a part of a kingdom that is unshakable. And he begins to do a contrast. And he contrasts between the old covenant and the new covenant. And he begins here what he started in chapter 1 of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews spends this whole book telling us that Jesus is better. He's writing to a group of Christians who were Jews at one time. Some of them were falling away from the faith. Some of them had stopped meeting together. They were growing cold. Others of them were going back into Judaism and the old practices. And the writer of Hebrews writes to them and says, listen, Jesus is better. In fact, the key word in the book of Hebrews is better. And it's used 13 times. Now, it's interesting, as you study this in the original language in the Greek, you'll discover that there are six different Greek words that are translated better. But the one Greek word that is used here in the book of Hebrews is creation, and that is used almost exclusively in the book of Hebrews. And it is used here 13 times. And it doesn't just mean better in the sense of something getting better, but Vine says that it means something that is intrinsically better. In other words, better from the beginning. You know, some things take time to get better. Cheese betters with age. They say wine betters with age. My wife, she certainly got better with age. <laughs> but... Jesus is not so. Jesus is better from the beginning. He is intrinsically good. He is the ancient of days. He was before all things from the time that he existed, and he always existed. He has been good, and he has been better. He has been best. Jesus is better. 
And he goes on to say this throughout the book. He starts in chapter 1, and he contrasts the things that people think are good and how Jesus is better. In chapter 1 and verse 1, he starts out by saying that Jesus is better than the prophets. He says in chapter 1 and verse 4, Jesus is better than the angels. He says in verse 4 that Jesus has been given a better name. He says in chapter 3 that Jesus is a better prophet than Moses. In chapter 4 that he is a better general than Joshua. In chapter 5 that he is a better priest than Aaron. He says in chapter 2 verse 5 that he is a better man than Adam. In chapter 2, verse 11, it says he is a better brother. In chapter 6 and verse 9, he says he has better things for us. Chapter 7, he has a better hope for us. Chapter 7, 22, he offers a better covenant to us. Chapter 8, a better ministry, a better promise. In chapter 9, he is a better tabernacle. In chapter 9, he is a better sacrifice. In chapter 10, he is a better way. In chapter 10, he is also a better possession. In chapter 12, he is a better discipline. He offers us a better city, and he speaks a better word because we are in a better kingdom, a kingdom that is unshakable. I love the way that he starts this letter in chapter 1 and verse 1 where he says, God, who at sundry times and in divers places and manners has spoken to us in the past, but in these last days... No longer through the prophets. Now, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. And verse 11 says, the world, all these things, they will perish. They will all wear out like a garment. But you, Jesus, remain the same, and your years will never end. I'm going to tell you this morning, Jesus is better than anything in your life. He has a better kingdom for us, an unshakable kingdom. And Hebrews shows us Jesus outspeaks the prophets. Prophets. Jesus outranks the angels. Jesus outlives the universe. Jesus is better. Say that with me this morning. Jesus is better. He is better. And now in chapter 12, he specifically contrasts two covenants. The old covenant, or the covenant of the law, the Mosaic covenant that he mentions here, and versus the new covenant, the covenant of grace that was ushered in through Jesus Christ. And he mentions this by contrasting two mountains. Mount Sinai in the desert and the wilderness, Exodus 19, or Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem in heaven. And he contrasts two kingdoms. The kingdoms of man versus the kingdom of of God. And he says that there will be two shakings. He mentions two shakings here. He mentions the first shaking on Mount Sinai at the giving of the law. And then he mentions the shaking that came through the new covenant. In other words, let me put it in perspective for you. As we read in the beginning in these first verses, this first four verses, when Moses and the children of Israel came to Mount Sinai, and God spoke, spoke. Literally, the ground was shaking, and it brought great fear and trembling to the people. The first shaking brought fear, the law. The first covenant was instituted in fear, and people lived in fear. But the second shaking, when Jesus, on Mount Calvary, when he gave his life's blood, and when he offered up the ghost and said, it is finished, the Bible says that an earthquake came and shook the ground where they were. But it wasn't fear. It was rejoicing by all the heavenly hosts were rejoicing and celebrating in heaven with great celebration, it says in the scripture, because Jesus has now mediated a new covenant that is better. No more fear. Instead, there is freedom. But then... The writer of Hebrews sneaks in something there that we don't understand. He says that there's going to be yet another shaking that's coming. 
And he quotes from Haggai chapter 2 and verse 6 about a future event that hasn't happened yet in which God will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. All of the universe that he has created, he says, will be shaken. This is the same event that Jesus talks about in Mark chapter 13 where he says, heaven and earth will pass away. This is the same event that Peter talked about in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 where he says, By the same word the, set, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. God is going to shake everything in this universe so that only those things belonging to the unshakable order will remain. And guess what? The author of Hebrews reminds us, this is the good part, we are a part of that unshakable kingdom. I just heard somebody say amen online. <laughs> We're a part of that unshakable kingdom. Now this coming shaking is going to be like a sifting. You know, one of my favorite things to fix that I don't fix very much because it's a lot of work, but I like to fix some good fried chicken wings. And I have a special battering and a special recipe and marinade that I'll put those wings in, and it's all liquid, and it, it marinates overnight in that, and then I have to take it out, and I have to put it through a sifter. Now, in New England, we don't use little colanders. In New England, we use big old steam buckets for sifters. I mean, that's what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> you can sift anything in this thing. We use it for crabs. We use it for, uh, uh, for steaming uh, mussels, but... but uh, as an illustration for you, it's got holes all in it, right? On the bottom and the sides, a colander, a sifter, a steamer, whatever you use, you put it in there and you shake it. And when you shake it, all the excess, all the stuff you don't want comes out the bottom and the good stuff stays inside. God says he's going to shake us. It's going to be a sifting to get rid of all of the excess, the things that will not remain, but there will remain some things, the good stuff. There's a TV show that I like to watch sometimes called Gold Rush. I don't know what it is that mesmerizes me about this show, but I like to watch this guy, Parker. And they go up in, Can in, uh, in Alaska, and now they're going to other parts of the world, but they went up in Alaska, and they go to these places and take a mine, and they get these big uh, uh, machines, and they just take giant scoops, like giant backhoes, and take giant scoops of the earth, and they put them in these big, giant sifters. And the sifters, when they put the rocks and the dirt and the gravel in there, it just shakes, the whole machine just shakes it as it comes down a conveyor belt and then they have water that sprays on it. And what happens is that gold is heavier than rock, heavier than dirt and other minerals. Minerals. In fact, one bar of gold, 400 troy ounces, weighs 27.4 pounds. <laughs> That's how heavy gold is. So what happens is as it's sifted, as it's shaken, that the gold will go down to the bottom and all the rocks and all the dirt will be washed away and when they're done, they'll take the tray out of the bottom and on that belt will be all the little flakes of gold because it's heavier and the only thing that remains is what is precious. And that's the same way it is with us. Sometimes God shakes us. Is it coming a time when he's going to shake the whole universe? Because what's going to happen is God's going to shake it all, and only what's precious is what remains. Only what's the most valuable is what remains. And in this text, he says, what will not remain will be the kingdoms of man, but what will remain will be all of the kingdom of God. And guess what? 
You and I are precious. We're like that gold. We're a part of that unshakable kingdom. It doesn't matter how hard things are shaken in your life. If you're a part of the kingdom of God, you will remain. You are precious to God. You are valuable to him. Now, you know what? I want to bring out this morning that this shaking is not just a future event. And the unshakable things that he mentions that are part of the kingdom of God in our text are not just valuable things for the future. They are things that we can experience right now. In fact, in our text, he, he, he lists for us, the writer of Hebrews, five different things that are unshakable in Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at them. First of all, he says, heaven, the new Jerusalem the city of Zion. Number two, angels. Number three, believers. And he mentions the, those are the firstborn, those of the church, those who have believed. He's talking about Old Testament believers who, who died in the Old Covenant, but their faith was accounted to the, credited to them as righteousness. They believed and therefore they were saved. And those in the New Covenant who believed and were born again, and are in heaven. He says all of the believers uh, are part of that kingdom. Number four, he says God the Father. And number five, he mentions Jesus the Son. And number five, his sprinkled blood, the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ. These are five unshakable things that are part of God's unshakable kingdom. And I want to take today and next week, we won't get through all these today, and talk about those unshakable things because they're a part of our life right now. And the first one he mentions is heaven. I believe that if God would allow a Christian to die and go to heaven and then come back again and be resurrected, and tell us everything that happened when he died and everything he saw in heaven, I believe it would bring great confidence and boldness to the believers in Christ. And maybe that has happened with some people. You hear stories, you read books, but a lot of us haven't heard their story. In the Bible, there are several people who died and were resurrected. They were risen again, but we didn't get to hear their story about heaven. There were two people in the scripture that God, uh, through a vision, brought them up and showed them heaven. That's the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John, John the Revelator. And they wrote and described some of the things that they saw. Uh, Paul said that a lot of things he saw, he was not able, God forbid him to share them with us. So he kind of encapsulates that and says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, he says, however, it is written, what the eye has not seen, what the ear has not heard, what the human mind has not conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who loved him. He says, it's really what I saw up there is incomprehensible. It's so much better than anything that you can imagine. Paul's vision of heaven caused him to lose all fear of death. He was a brave soul. Once they stoned him to death, they prayed and laid hands on him. God brought him back up. He got on his feet and went back in the city and preached to the same people that just stoned him. Why? He wasn't afraid of death. Why? Because he knew what was coming. He knew he was part of an unshakable kingdom. He knew, listen, that death could not shake him. I want to tell you this morning, I just want to remind you today that death has no hold on the children of God. Jesus came to defeat and destroy death, hell, and the grave. And I like that old song that says, ain't no grave going to hold my body down. I'm telling you that as a child of God, if you're one of these people that's mentioned in this text, if you're a part of the church, if you're a part of the firstborn, if you're a part of those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that when you die and they put your body in the ground, that's not the end of you. Jesus said in John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. 
neither let them be afraid. If you believe in my Father, believe also me. I am going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. It speaks to us. You're in a pandemic. People are dying all around you. Unbelievers are dying. Believers are dying. Young people, old people. God says, don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. If you die, God has a new house prepared for you, and it's better than anything here. Heaven is a real place that is prepared for us, people. Heaven is real. Say it with me. Heaven is real. It's real. I'm telling you, God forbid that this should happen in Jesus' name. But if COVID-19 was to take my body and put me down, and you had to bury me in the grave, I want you to pull up the sermon snippet, and I want you to play it at my funeral. I just like to say, COVID cannot keep me down. Nothing can keep me down. COVID didn't defeat me because when I left this house, I just stepped right into my new house. I never ceased to. Don't let anybody say, Pastor Lane is dead. I'm more alive than I ever have been before. Paul said, for me to live as Christ, but to die is only gain. There's only something better coming for us. So we don't be afraid. We don't be troubled. We don't have anxiety and worry. He said, what's the worst thing that can happen? I could die? Okay, so you die. So then what? Now things get better for you. God is a good God, and he has only goodness for us. Hallelujah. That's great news today. Now, we talk about heaven. It's unshakable. And the second thing that's unshakable he mentions in our text is angels. Not only is heaven is real, Angels are real. And you know what? The, we learn in Hebrews that angels were created to minister to us. Isn't that awesome? So we said heaven is real. Now say it with me. Angels are real. Just say it out loud. Angels are real. They are real. Now the writer of Hebrews mentions in the first chapter of Hebrews, he talks in the whole chapter mostly about angels. And he talks about how Jesus, his ministry is superior than the angels' ministry. But in that chapter, we learn a little bit about angels. Specifically, we learn two things. Number one, we learn that they were created to be servants of God. In chapter 1 and verse 7, he says, In speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels spirits and his servants, underline, his servants, Flames of fire. So angels were created to be his servants. Secondly, if you go on down to verse 10, we see that they were created as servants to minister to Christians. That's right. Listen to this verse. It says, are they not all, all of them, ministering spirit, service, sent to minister to who? Sent to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. That's us. We're the heirs of salvation. God has sent angels to minister to us. Isn't that beautiful? We have this angelic force that is with us. We have these powerful spirit beings that are here to help us through this journey of life. You got to understand that causes us to be unshakable. It's interesting. You say, well, how many angels are there? Do we have guardian angels? All this stuff. The Bible has a lot to say about angels. But here's what I'd like to say about them there's a lot of them. In our verse, it says, You have come to, to the New Jerusalem accompanied by thousands and thousands of angels. Now, this term is to describe an unnumberable number. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, and Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11, both have a vision of heaven and there are angels. And both of them say this, that the number of angels was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now, I believe that that's figurative speech saying, in other words, there were so many we can't number. Kind of like saying, as the sand of the sea. 
but it does mention specific numbers. So let's just say that this is an actual number. Let's do the math. 110,000 times 10,000, if you add it up, equals what? You know, 100 million. And thousands of thousands means at least 1,000 times 1,000. 1,000 times 1,000 is 1 million. That means, according to these two verses, that there are a minimum, a bare minimum, of 101 million angels. If God hasn't created more. You say, well, that's a lot of angels, but you know what? There's, there's a lot more people on the earth than angels. There's a lot more Christians than that. There's probably two or three billion Christians and these 101 million angels. But don't, listen, listen to this. You don't understand the power of one angel. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, one angel in just a couple of hours put to death 70,000 70,000 men. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, we have the story of the Assyrians coming in a vast army against King Hezekiah. And Isaiah and Hezekiah prayed to God. And the Bible says that one angel, one angel was sent and annihilated, that's the word it used, annihilated all of the fighting men and the commanders in the office, in the, in the camp of the Assyrian king. One angel could put together, could fight a whole army. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps around about those who fear him and protects them. <laughs> if one angel can take out a whole city, there is over a hundred million angels at our disposal. I'm telling you, we are unshakable in the kingdom of God. In fact, in Romans, in Revelation chapter 20, it says there's just going to be one angel that's going to come and snatch Satan, Lucifer, that old dragon, and bind him in chains and throw him into the abyss. That's the power of angels. And writer of Hebrews says that these angels are sent to minister to us. That's the unshakable kingdom we're a part of. Heaven is real, it's unshakable, and it will remain forever. Angels are real, they're unshakable, and they will remain forever. And they are there for us. Now there's three more things I want to talk about in this text. We'll save them for next week. I feel like I need to stop right now and ask you a very important question today. Suppose God was to take your body and shake you and sift your soul right out of your body. In other words, suppose today you would die. If you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? Are you a part of God's unshakable kingdom? That could be the most important question that anybody ever asked you. Are you a part of the unshakable kingdom? Now, I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me because maybe you're here today and you're saying to yourself, you know what? <laughs> all these unshakable things are not a part of my life. My life feels like it's all falling apart. My life feels like nothing is happening. My life feels like there's nothing together. It's like, Everything is shakable. Listen, God has an unshakable kingdom for you. And the way that you enter into that kingdom is through Jesus. He has provided a better covenant for us. That means a better contract, a better agreement, a better arrangement. And here's what Jesus says. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart because out of the heart man believes and with the mouth he confesses heart first 
right here. This is the most important thing. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is alive, that he is risen from the dead, that heaven is real, that Jesus is real and he is alive and that he has made a way for you to be a part of an unshakable kingdom. If you believe that in your heart and if you'll confess that with your mouth and say to him, I'm shakable. My life is a life that is broken from sin, from mistakes I've made, from being in this fallen world. I understand I am a sinner. And I need that grace that God provides for me. If that's you this morning and the Holy Spirit has just been working in your heart, especially through this pandemic, you've been questioning the things of God and you've been wondering, really? Is this God stuff real? The Holy Spirit has been working on you and you're ready now to receive Him. You're ready now to turn your life to Him. You see that we are not really in control of this world, that there is a higher power, God Almighty, who is sovereign over all and has authority and power over all. And in one day, he can shake the earth. And one day, he can shake your life. And you need to know that what's really important will remain in your life. If that's you this morning, are you ready to pray this prayer? I want you to pray with me right now. Just bow your head, close your eyes wherever you are. Not if you're driving, of course. But I'm, I'm saying that to shut everything else out around you. If you need to pull over on the side of the road, pull over on the side of the road. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to say, I believe in you, Jesus, that you are alive. And I believe that you came to free me for my sin and I have lots of sin <laughs> so I ask you today to take all my sin and to wash me away put me in your sifter shake me today take all the sin and junk and let it come out of me and just put in me your Holy Spirit what is pure, what is unshakable, what is valuable, what is eternal, what will last forever. I need your help. God, come to me today. Show me the way. In Jesus' name, I pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, there's a link right above you or maybe below you, depending on your, uh, what you're watching us through. There's a link there that says, this is my first time watching, or a link there that says, I prayed this prayer today. I accepted Christ today as my Savior. Will you click on that link and give us your information because we've got some resources to give you. We want to help you. We want to get you on this unshakable journey until you know that it doesn't matter what happens in your life, you're an unshakable person because you're a part of an unshakable kingdom. Next week, we'll conclude this series talking about how to be unshakable people as part of an unshakable kingdom. I want to thank you for joining us today. Tonight at 6 o'clock, I want you to come back and watch us live stream. We're going to have live prayer. Specifically tonight, we're going to be taking your requests, praying the requests you brought in. You can, you, this, is a, uh, this is a meeting that is live where you can text us. You can, you can write on YouTube and Facebook. Give us your prayer request, and we will pray with you right there online. It's powerful. It's real. Tonight, we're going to be praying for those victims who are sick with COVID-19 and the workers in the hospital and those who are, who are the heroes that are helping them out. We're going to be praying for them. Everybody probably knows somebody now who is fighting this virus. And we want you to call in tonight.
We want you to text in tonight. We want you to write in tonight their name so that we can call their name out in agreement prayer with you for their healing and for their deliverance. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you tonight at 6 o'clock. God bless you. Love one another.